en ons volgende segment gesels ons Klong van Clarence, Jornij van Huisteen, met die schrijver Norman McFarlane oor sy nieuwe boek Surviving the Secret War in Angola. So Norman, a big welcome. Thank you very much, Jornij. It's lovely to be with you. I just want to tell you, I'm just around the corner where your grandmother lived in Senegal. Oh my word, that's amazing. Yeah, that's amazing. it was a... Uh, wow. An interesting part in, of, of the book, you know, my father also was at school, uh, born and raised in, in Roosendal and went to Senegal. But let's talk about your book. I want to start off, you started writing in 2014, and it's a really long time. Yes, um, I, I started the book when I had gotten to a point in my recovery back then where my, my counsellor felt that it was all right for me to start writing the book. And it, it wasn't an easy book to write because, and I know you've read the book, so a great deal of what happened up there had to come back. It had to become in my head again. I had to remember. And quite often that time of writing was 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 very difficult. I remember I was I was sitting uh, in uh, late November of 20, I think 2019, if I recall correctly, and I was I was heading towards writing about what happened on my birthday, my 20th birthday, and I knew that I was going to have to write about that next. And I put the manuscript aside and I didn't touch it for six months because I knew what I was going to have to write about. So it was very much a stop-start affair. But towards the end of completing the manuscript, because my dear wife, Epi, was whipping me quietly to finish the manuscript, I then just put my head down and, and I finished it. And it mm. came to an end a lot more quickly than I thought it would. And I just want to introduce the book. It's called Across the Border, Surviving the Secret War in Angola. And it's it's a very personal book. That's what I enjoyed. There's a lot of books about the, the border war, but this is your story and from the start you really drag people in get us interested in your story and it's gripping up to the end and we're going to talk about the trauma but <clears throat> um just interesting last night i had uh, dinner with a, a friend and he was um, uh, now in angola after all these years on a 20 uh, 20 days fishing trip, and he showed me pictures of still tanks uh, more cuban tanks that's still just beside the road and he was also, I think, in Khred Flat, but he never went to war. But he was immediately interested and said he wants to book. Um, and I think he's going to speak to a lot of people. Let's just go back to the training part. Very young, but the whole concept of cutting hair, looking the same, indoctrination, um, the whole thing about going to war, this, the Rui Gefar and the Swart Gefar. Your experience, um, we're, going to, we're going to touch on Russia a bit later on. But that that whole indoctrination part um, with with young men in dangerous situations. Yeah, look, I, you know, I, I I went in conflicted because of my my background and my upbringing and the time that I spent with uh, my uncle through marriage, Donald Woods, um, sitting at his feet, literally listening to him talk about what was going on in our country. So when I went in, I was conflicted. Um, I was there because I didn't have much choice. I was too much of a coward to say, no, I'm not going to go. I didn't want to end up in jail, so I went. Um, but but that, that indoctrination is something, and I do write about it in the book, is that that's the way people get trained in the military. You get trained to act and not think. And that's what we were told so often. You're not here to think. You're here to do as you are told. And I... I Basically, what they're trying to do is turn you into a killer. And despite my background, I felt it extremely difficult to resist that. So it's also a case of you with other people and you want to be, you want to feel accepted that you're part, you're part of the crowd, you're part of the group of people that you're with. Um, and But it, it's insidious. It, it's really difficult to, the fact that I went up into Angola is an indication as to just how insidious it, it was. Mm. And and our social media question today is is what border have you recently crossed? And this is the secret war in Angola. You know, not even your parents knew where, where you were exactly. Um, and then uh, let me take you back to that first fight, that trauma. 
a, a young person, all of a sudden, I mean, there's people dying around you. And I want to find out why do you think a lot of men still romanticize the concept of war? And I know the brotherhood and everything. Well, they look back at the border war and they go like, yes, that, those, was, those were the days we were real men. What's this fascination with war? I have no fascination with war. War is, a, is an abomination. Um, the, 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 the desire to be back there isn't a desire to fight that war again. It's the desire to be in a space where you're at risk, you're in danger, and life is at its sweetest. And I know this sounds terribly corny, but this is really what it's about when you are at extreme risk. And I subsequently pursued risky activities, dangerous sports, and so on and so forth, because of that rush. It was there. But the desire to be with your comrades is not a desire to fight that war. It's just a desire to be with people that you were up there with and with whom you still have uh, an enormous bond, a bond of unbreakable friendship and support. And I was up in in Durban recently for uh, one of the launches that I did, and I got together with people I haven't seen for 35 years. Sure. And, Jornay, it was as if we had seen each other the preceding week, literally. That's how strong the bond is. And coincidentally, they all agree with me that it was an illegal war. We had no right to be there. But we are solid and firm friends. One of my friends, uh, Russell Hayes, calls me regularly to check in on me and see how I'm doing. I call him, we talk, because that bond is just still so strong. Mm. On, a, on a funny note, how difficult was it to be an Englishman? Um, you know, you, you write about it a lot and the names you were called. Was it a bit more difficult than just, you know, a lot of Afrikaans guys in the army? Start me so after me, but my Afrikaans is really good, your name. <laughs> okay, that's great. Now, no one is Afrikaans prof. I'm struggling in yeah. <laughs> And still, uh, personal things like like um, the the hearing loss. For years, you didn't realize what the damage was done to your to your ears. How's how's the ears now? Well, these days I wear hearing aids. I, I succumbed in 2018 when, when our younger daughter, Alexandra, looked at me and wagged her finger at me, which she's very good at doing when she wants her dad to do something. And she said, Dad, if you don't go and have something done about your hearing, the part of your brain that would normally process the sounds that you can't hear will atrophy. And that's not going to be a good thing because bad things are going to happen to you. So I swallowed my pride. I went and had a hearing test done and I ended up wearing hearing aids. And they do make a difference. They make an enormous difference, but I will always have hearing impairment. Mm. We're, gonna, we're gonna talk about the trauma and the healing uh, after the seven o'clock news, but let's just uh, introduce it. There was just a scene that's been for years, the boy in the road. Um, why, did you, why do you think it took you so long to get help for, for um, PTSD and, and, and all the trauma? Because I was a typical South African male. I, I, if he said to me many times, normally you have to go and get help. And my response was typical. It was, it was entirely characteristic. There's, I'm not going to go and see some shrink. I can deal with this on my own. It's going to be fine. I'll, I'll be all right. Just, just leave me alone. And that went on for decades. Until I eventually realized when I hit rock bottom that I, I actually, and you know, if he, if he came home one day and um, I was sitting up in our study upstairs and, and I was in tears watching video play on my computer and she said, what's wrong? And I just pointed at it and she looked at me and she said, you right and I really need to go and get help. And I, what I heard in that, the unspoken words were, you'd better do something about it because if you don't, I'm going to take the girls and we're going to leave. Norman, we're going to chat about that and really try to motivate guys that may be still struggling, um, or not guys, men, really men, um, with this. My you can ask about it now. The series is across the border, surviving the Sikh war in Angola. You can read the book Rest. I think that is a fantastic book. Norman McFarland came from our summit. Also, the results were his book Surviving the Secret War in Angola. We'll go back to your name. Well, thank you, Pierre. 
Norman, welcome back. On spraat verder hierdie across the border, the surviving the secret war in Angola. In all dit gewilde boeken, maar ek denk is op een ander manier geskryf, is een baie meer persoonlijke journey, personal journey. So Norman, let's talk about the scene, um, and we don't have to go that graphic, but this, there was this, this boy that was killed, and that scene always reoccurred, there's trigger points. Was that the first sign of P PTSD that you realized, listen, there's trauma? I, don't, I didn't understand at the time what was happening, Jordan, but the, 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 that image stuck in my head, um, and it stuck in my head for decades after that. I didn't understand what had happened to me. I had no clue, but as time went by, I began to realize that I had a problem. I didn't understand what it was. Um, but that image, for whatever reason, stayed with me. And it literally was a watermark. And I, I describe it as a watermark in the book. And it became the watermark through which I saw every second of my life. And I came to accept it. But it troubled me. It still troubles me at times when I when I think about it as I do now if I was an artist which I'm not I could paint that picture for you mm -hmm. and it stayed with me until I eventually sought help and it was it was after I had cleared out after I demobilized it 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 I, I realized that things were not right with me I was different but I didn't fully really understand how different I'd become if you can give advice um, and even like you said you're still in contact with a lot of guys what do you think what brings healing you know for me the book is not it's not a war story it, it's not intended to be a war story when I started to write it I, I started to write the book because I'd done a fair amount of research at that point into what had been written about Operation Savannah, which was the first made major cross-border incursion into Angola. And I found virtually no mention of the two battle groups with which I and my comrades fought. And considering where I was at the time, emotionally and psychologically, I was outraged by the fact that the fact that we'd been up there was completely ignored. So the commencement of writing the book was to provide memory and, and I do say in the beginning of the book, for all the forgotten soldiers, you shall be remembered. And that was the original intention when I started writing the book. But as the narrative unfolded and I got to the part of the book or the narrative beyond military service, I began to realize that it was more about what happened to me, how I managed to, with an enormous amount of help from my family and from my counselor, get myself to the point where I could function relatively normally. And for me, it became an appeal to anybody who has struggled with the affliction that I have for whatever reason, be it because of military service, be it because of a traumatic event in that individual's life, there is hope, there is help out there. Reach out and grasp that help and take your life back. So for me, children, it's become a journey of telling people that they need to take their lives back and that there is help. A very dear friend of mine, a very dear friend who lives in Somerset West, was at one of the book launches that, that um, I did recently at Somerset Mall at uh, Exclusive Books, and um, his wife spoke out at the launch event, and subsequently, and he's had a great deal of difficulty of late, he struggled enormously. His wife told me last night in a telephone conversation that after listening to me, he realized that he needed once again to go and seek help. Mm -hmm. And that is what makes me, that's what makes this journey for me worthwhile, is that people are reaching out. And at every event I've been to, people have come to me and said, thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. I'm going to go and seek the help that I now know that I need. And that, mm -hmm. for me, is what this book is about, Johnny. Mm. Um, a very current story, Norman, is, is the first soldier that was sentenced for war crimes in the Ukraine now, 
Um, I see his face in front of me, 20 years old. You can see he's, he's really a kid and he shot some civilians. And, he's, and he said that he's really sorry. And it's very current. What will you tell that boy if you could sit down with him now? If I could, I'd talk to him about what he'd been through. I'd find out if I could where his head was at. And the fact that he has been sentenced for war crimes is a reality, but he cannot be in anything approaching a good space. He's in a terrible space. And despite what he's done, he deserves, he has the right to be helped so that despite the fact that he's facing jail time, he at the very least can get to a point in his life where he feels that there is a future for him, that it's not the end of his life. I've seen so many people who have died in the most appalling circumstances as a result of this affliction, Jornet. Uh, comrades of mine that, that, that are, no, are no longer with us, that have died in the most awful circumstances, lost their families, lost everything, succumbed to substance abuse, and have eventually died in the most awful circumstances. And nobody deserves that, Jornet. Nobody. Nobody deserves to have been sent to war by politicians who don't give a damn, who send young men to die and put that young man in a position where he did what he did. Lord knows what was going through his head when it happened. I don't know. But if he hadn't been there at the time, he wouldn't have done those things. Yeah. And that's, yeah. that's the, that, that is the abomination of war. And people ask me, do you want to go back and fight the war? I don't want to go and fight the war. I don't, we don't need war. Why, why do we, as, as the human species, the apex predator species in the world, we're supposed to be capable, intelligent, thinking human beings. But the reality of it is that we kill each other. And yeah. that's what we do. Our solution mm. to conflict and disagreement is to kill each other. Norman, I can sense your gentleness. Um, oh, if you see there's something on my head, I connected an apple tree. So apple tree <laughs> one, me zero. Uh, Norman, thank you so much. Um, I really wish you could talk to that kid. Um, I will motivate people to get this book. If you, even if you would, ugh, anybody can read it. You don't need to be um, an old soldier or anything. Norman, all of the best. And uh, we're looking forward to the, the upcoming books. I see there's more books coming. 